Needing strength for my journey, I knelt at the cross where Jesus once died for me. And I asked, is this the place where hope abides? And this he said to me, beyond the cross is a tomb that is empty. You won't find me there anymore. And beyond the tomb is life everlasting. And Thank you, ladies. That's a great song, great message in that song. You do understand that what sets Christianity apart from every other religion out there is the resurrection. Every religion, and I hate the word religion, but every religion has a founder or a leader uh, that has made lots of claims Uh, But no group of people lay claim to a Savior that was crucified, buried, and three days later rose again. So when you, uh, you know, if you're encountered with somebody who asks a question, say, what what makes Christianity such a big deal or whatever? Just tell them about the resurrection. Mohammed's still dead. Charles Taz Russell's still dead. Joseph Smith is still dead. Uh, All of them. All of them. Uh, John and Charles Wesley are still dead. Now, John and Charles Wesley, they were the founders of the Methodists, and and they're not, that's, they're not, they were not a cult, but they, they did found a particular denomination. But uh, we're the only ones that can claim a risen, living Savior. He was the only person that came out of the grave on his own power and never went back again. He never died. 
Uh, Lazarus was raised after the fourth day, but Lazarus still died later. But Jesus never did. Take your Bible, and uh, that's my uh, resurrection message, all right? Luke 15, <clears throat> Luke chapter number 15. Luke chapter number 15, <clears throat> look in verse number 11, Luke chapter 15, verse number 11, the Bible says, uh, this is the Lord talking here, telling a, telling a story, a true story, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want." And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he, would and he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, excuse me, and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now, that's where we're going to concentrate uh, for the message, but I do want to read about this other brother. Look at verse 25. Now his, elder brother, uh, now, his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. You know what the problem with this old other brother was? He had a sorry attitude. He ought to have been rejoicing that the brother who was, who was gone has come back again. But like a typical person in today's society, he turned a story that was all about his brother into all about me. And he was angry, would not go in, therefore came his father out and treated him. And he said, answering and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come. Yeah, that's the whole point. Duh. Which hath devoured thy living with harlots. Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. <clears throat> I want to preach to you this morning on this thought, on the path of the prodigal. The path of the prodigal. Let me say this. Uh, first of all, let's define prodigal. The word prodigal means given to extravagant expenditures. Now, prodigal doesn't mean you left. Do you know that a lot of prodigals 
like this older brother, never leave. They stay right there. And uh, uh, expending money or other things without necessity, profuse, lavish, wasteful, not frugal or economical. As a prodigal man, the prodigal son, a man may be prodigal of his strength, of his health, of his life or blood, as well of, of his money. Uh, it means lavish, expended to excess or without necessity, uh, very liberal, profuse, uh, one that expends money, uh, one that is profuse or lavish, a waster. So tell me that we don't have uh, people that never go to the far country but are still prodigal. And prodigals come in all ages, all degrees of maturity. You can be as faithful to the house of God as you can be. You're there when the doors are open, but you can still be prodigal. And so I want to, uh, I want to look at some things here that uh, we see in this prodigal son. And I want to say to you, number one, he was thinking things he should not have thought. He was thinking things he should not have thought. What are you saying? Well, uh, he says there uh, in verse number 12, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of things that fall to me. Now, he didn't just do that one day. He thought about it. This built up over time. And, um, and I remember Brother Hardman preaching a message years ago on when you're going catches up with your leaving. The prodigal left long before he departed. And uh, he didn't just wake up one day and decide to leave. He, he'd been thinking about this uh, for a while. I wonder, now we can only assume, okay, uh, but it would be very fitting. I wonder if this prodigal was influenced by some friends. Say amen. Is it 100% sure? Do we know? No. But I tell you this. Something influenced him to leave. Young people, you better watch out who you're hanging out with. I know who some of you are hanging out with. And you're hanging out with people you shouldn't be hanging out with. You have good friends that should not be your good friends. I don't care about loyalty. There's a difference between right and wrong. And you better be loyal to truth and you better be loyal to right instead of other bonds that are only skin deep. Amen, preacher. That's good preaching even if I am doing it. A friend who encourages rebellion is not your friend. A friend who encourages disrespect towards authority is not your friend. A friend who encourages worldliness is not your friend. You say, if you preach this kind of stuff, people will leave. If I preach this stuff and they leave, they've already left. A, pre a friend who encourages hatred for authority and the church is not your friend. There might be some here who have even contemplating and wondered, is it worth it? Is it worth it to stay or is it worth it to go? Now, I knew a guy years ago, he preached a message and, and his pastor rebuked him for it. Uh, he, he was just a young preacher boy at the time. And he preached a message, get right or get out. I don't want anybody to get out. I want people to get right. Amen. I want people to get right. People wonder, like this, like, uh, like this uh, prodigal, he thought things would be better out there. That didn't happen. That didn't work. You know, in, in today's modern language, we, we, language, we would say, how'd that work out for you? How'd that work out for you? Will it be better? And I've learned this. I've seen prodigals. I've been saved 40 years, 40 plus years. I have seen prodigals that have left and, and looked for things out in the world that they had in the church 
And when they got out there, it wasn't the way it was going to be. It wasn't what they thought it was going to be. And the very things they left for, they already had in the church. Well, what are you saying? I'm going to go out there and hang out with my real friends. Heathens, lost, or backslidden rebels are not real friends. There's no greater people than God's people. Are we perfect? No. We got, we got a visitor here, a friend of Miss Rose's. Laura, I said, well, if you like weirdos, we're a good place. You, you know, you might fit in here. Amen. We're not perfect. Amen. But, we, but listen, uh, we make mistakes. We will let you down. I will let you down. You will let me down. But God's people are the best people there is. When the prodigal messed up, did he go to his friend's? To get restored or did he go back home? He went back home. Now, here's a sad thing, and I've got it in my notes, but I might miss it, so I'm going to tell you now. Not all prodigals go back home. As a matter of fact, some who go out as a prodigal bank on the fact that, oh, one day I'll go back. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. If you're saved, God might kill you before you get a chance to go back. If you're bound and determined to do wrong. You say, I, I don't believe God would kill anybody. Have you read your Bible? Oh, that's Old Testament. Have you read the book of Acts? Have you read about in the book of Acts, chapter number 5, when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Ghost? Now, we're talking after the resurrection, right? You, you cannot get any more than in the New Testament age of grace. And they lied to the Holy Ghost, and, they, and God killed both of them on the spot. They were buried before the sun went down. You say, I thought we were supposed to have like an Easter message today. Yeah, this is an Easter message. Staying right with our risen Savior, amen? I know if I, if, I could just, if I could just get out there, I'd have freedom. Yeah, sort of like, I don't want nobody telling me what to do. I joined the Marines. Mm-hmm. Yep. What, what's that old saying? How'd that work out for you? Amen. He was thinking things he shouldn't have thought. And because of that, number two, he had an attitude he shouldn't have had. Look at verse number 12. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me. Not, Father, I was just wondering if it would be okay. No, he demanded. You know how you could tell you're a prodigal? You got a sorry attitude. And this world is filled with bad attitudes. Bad attitudes are promoted by the world. We live in this day and age today where everybody is angry. Society tells them they're supposed to be angry. Uh, Father, give me. You, 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 you know... Uh, uh, you, you can tell a lot of times what uh, people are going to do by their attitude. I've seen bad attitudes in young people. I've seen bad attitudes in older people. And I know what's coming. I've, I've been around the block a couple of times. And it's just a matter of time before the inevitable happens. He did not come with a humble, respectful Attitude, he was disrespectful. And you know, a lot of times we have that same, the, the same attitude that the prodigal had with his father, we have that attitude sometimes with our father. Lord, if you don't do this, then I'm going to do this. Or, Lord, you do this, and then I'll do this. Who in the world are we telling God what he is supposed to do? He doesn't even have to have the thought and he can snuff us out like yesterday's fire, amen. And we're going to dictate to God what he is supposed to do. Not going to happen. How's that working for you? Yeah. 
Number one, we said he wasn't thinking right, and, and, and then he had an attitude he shouldn't have. Not thinking right will affect your attitude. Not thinking right will affect your attitude. I've seen people a lot of times get depressed and you wonder why they're always depressed and then you find out that they don't do nothing, they don't get out, they never go anywhere, they never do anything, they just sit, or sit around and watch the news all day long. Well, that'll depress you. That influence that you're seeing, the news that you watch is an influence that is affecting you and then it, it gets you to thinking crazy and then you got a bad attitude. You better be careful. Um, if you want to not be a prodigal, have an attitude of humility. Have an attitude of thankfulness. Have an attitude of respect. Amen. Contentment. Go over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, look at verse number 1. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, verse 2 says, for men shall be. So what he's saying is, we know that we're in the last days. Based, uh, uh, a person could tell whether or not it's the last days based on these Conditions. Okay, let's see how we're doing and whether we're in the last days or not. For men shall be lovers of their own selfies. I'm telling you, one of the most hilarious things, I, I see it in airports all the time. I see it in, I, I, I brought my phone with me because I, I wanted to look up a definition. But I'll see people, sadly it's guys and girls, but I'll see people in a restaurant or in an airport somewhere, and they're like this. And they're just clicking, man, just clicking away, taking pictures of themselves. One day, I almost came real close. This girl, was she was, I mean, she was wrapped up in that selfie session. And I, I was this close, uh, Fisher, to going up to her and saying, can I just ask why? Just Why? Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous. I, really, honestly, I don't think we're in the last days because I don't see anybody that's lovers of their own selves. I don't see any covetousness going on. <laughs> Boasters. <laughs> Hello, social media. <laughs> Proud. Blasphemers. The President of the United States this week did one of the most blasphemous things any American president, probably the most blasphemous thing an American president that I know of did. He took the most sacred day, supposedly, as, as people would say, on the Christian's calendar, the resurrection of Christ, and made it an official day of abomination. In case you don't know what I'm talking about today, I mean the President of the United States signed an executive order, an executive declaration declaring today being National Trans Visibility Day. I just want to be honest with you, I'm really not interested in being in America that much longer. The only thing that he didn't do by doing that was go out and say, okay, God, send us your judgment. So in the, within the space of four days, the United States took its hardest anti-Israel stand in the UN, and the very next day, a bridge named after the author of the national anthem Collapsed, not a coincidence. And then he signed that abominable uh, uh, declaration this week. And they're saying that the biggest nor'easter to hit in years has come in the middle of the week. Not a coincidence. 
we read the Bible and we say, man, God really judged that place. Look how he took them people out. But because today it's under the guise of natural disasters, we don't associate it with the judgment of God. But it absolutely is the judgment of God. All right, blasphemers. I don't know, anybody ever seen disobedient to parents? Couldn't possibly be the last days. Unthankful. Man, we live in the most unthankful generation of my time. People don't expect things from people today. They demand things from people today. Unholy. Man, if there's ever a time in my life where people that claim to be saved do not live holy lives, it's where we live today. Number three, without, or verse three, without natural affection. Hello. I don't give a rip what the world says. I don't care what the psychologists say. It is not natural for a man to want to be with another man. That's not natural. It's not natural for a woman to want to be with another woman. That's not natural. It is not natural for a five-year-old kid to want to be a cat. Start treating them like that, cats then. Make them, make them stay outside at night. Feed them cat food for breakfast. They want to be a cat, treat them like a cat. You will cure their desire to want to be a cat in a matter of a couple of days. Where are you going? I got to go to the bathroom. No, you don't go to the bathroom in there. We got a litter box out back. You go out there. That'll cure that. Without natural affection. It is not natural for a man to want to turn into a woman or the other way. That's not natural. Do you realize that all of that stuff legally is still classified as a mental illness? Do you know that one of the founders of the gender reassignment surgery has said we sh it was the biggest mistake of me in, in medical history in our lifetime? Should have never done it. Without natural affection, truce breakers. Nobody keeps their word anymore. Nobody keeps their bond anymore. It's gotten so bad, you used to get in trouble if you broke a deal with a handshake. Now you can get out of a written contract with a signature legally. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers. Listen, my hope is not in Donald Trump, but I'm just telling you right now, all these liberals, are, they are the exact thing that they're accusing him of being. Incontinent. That's no self-control. That's, that's sins of the flesh, sexual appetite and such. Man, you can't, e you can't even scroll on social media without uh, uh, some ad depicting something sexual coming at you. Fierce. Anger. Intense. Despisers of those that are good. Do you know that I'm the bad guy today for preaching like I'm preaching today? You have a church in town flying the sodomite flag and we preach against that. We're the bad guys. I'm not going to go over there. I'm not going to tear that flag down. That's private property. But I can preach against it from this pulpit and will. But if you stand for anything that's good, you're the bad guy. You're the hate monger. Uh, number four, traitors. Washington's full of them. Republican and Democrat. Both sides of the aisle. Mitch McConnell is one of the biggest traitors. The current speaker of the house, well, everybody was all touting him that he was a Christian and, and that he was a Baptist and he even carried, he's a Southern Baptist, so he's not really a Baptist, but he, he carried a King James Bible. He just betrayed the American people two weeks ago. Heady, high-minded. How about this? Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. 
Do you know there are people all over America today could not be, uh, uh, it, it could not be interested in going to church today because it, it, it ruins their plans. Well, Sunday's the only day that I get off. I couldn't care less. Sunday is God's day. Sunday is the Lord's day. Amen. Number f verse 5 having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. We have people today that, that, that deny the power of God. You say, how do they do that? Well, I see one of the biggest ways they deny the power of God is they deny the power of the gospel. Where's all that stuff stem from? Bad thinking leads to bad attitudes. Go over to Psalm 16. The sad thing is, is just like the prodigal, they will trade flesh, they will trade the father's house for what they want to do. Psalm 16, look in verse number five. The Bible says, the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. You know, you know what the son, the prodigal son, you know what his problem was? His inheritance wasn't the father. His inheritance was stuff. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you perfectly satisfied with the father or what you can get out of him. What's your inheritance? Is it God? Are you okay with just God? Or is it what he gives you? Now, don't get me wrong. I, is there anybody in this room who does not want the blessings of God? Okay, think hard before you answer. I want the blessings of God. I all, year, all these years being saved, I kind of enjoy God's blessings. But what if he stopped the blessings? Would we be okay knowing that we have just him? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So because we have him, we have everything that we need. You want to know what the prodigal son had a bad attitude about? He thought he deserved better. He thought he deserved better. No, let me tell you what you and I deserve today. We deserve eternity in hell. And we, des we not only deserve to go to hell, we deserve to be there right now. That's what we deserve. But God, who is rich in mercy, amen. All right, go to Proverbs chapter number 16. Talking about attitude, Proverbs chapter number 16. Verse number 19. Better it is to be of an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. One of the biggest... Oh, I'm trying to think of the right word here. One of the biggest challenges that parents have in raising children is making sure their children have the right attitude. I've told you this story before. I'll tell it to you again. Friends of ours, they tell their kids, fix your spirit. Fix your spirit. Change your attitude. You know what an unchecked attitude in a young child will lead to? Father, give me. I'm out of here. The worst thing parents can do to, to their kids' attitudes is to appease them. Is to appease them. And look down at verse 32. Or, um, verse 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than... He that taketh the city. Listen, we all have attitudes. 
It's just a matter of whether we got a good one at the moment or a bad one. Go over to chapter 25. Verse 28, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. What is a city that is broken down and without walls? It's destruction. You, you know why? Why we have to control our attitudes? Because you know what? If we go through life with a bad attitude, you know what we're going to leave behind? Destruction. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter number 13. Look at verse number 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as ye have. All right, those of you that read books, that like books, here's a book. You ready? Write it down. Here's a title. The rare jewel of Christian contentment. The rare jewel of Christian contentment. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Did you put the first part of that verse with the second part of that verse? Be content with what you have. Well, according to that verse, what do we have? Him. We're supposed to be content with him. This prodigal son was not content or thankful for parents who worked hard to give him a good living. I, I, young people who have parents that are still alive, I don't care if you're five years old, eight years old, 15 years old, 20 years old, 25 years old. When was the last time you ever said thank you to mom and dad for making sure you didn't go without? I'm not trying to embarrass my mom, but she had an injury at work and they would never release her. She, she couldn't officially take a job and, and, and uh, it was a hand injury from a nursing home. Uh, some old man did not want to be moved. And she couldn't go out and go to work as far as getting a job. But you know what? That's one of the hardest working people I know. She made sure we had what we needed. We, I'm not saying we didn't have 37 Nintendos and 37 Xboxes. I'm talking about we had food. We had clothes. We had a place to live. She mowed lawns. She shoveled snow off roofs in the wintertime. She did. What she, and, and we have kids today, parents just like that, doing the same exact thing. And they are not thankful for what they have. Hey, young people, maybe you don't have what other people have. So what? Or let me put it to you a better loving way. Get over it. <laughs> Just get over it. He had an attitude he shouldn't have. And then let's go back over to Luke chapter 15. We see number three, he went to a place he shouldn't have went. Verse 13, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. Can I just tell you, I, 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 if you're saved, this applies to you. It doesn't matter young, old, how long you've been saved, not saved, or not, whatever. Here's, here's what I'm saying. There are just some places that a child of God has got no business being. Ain't, ain't got any business being. You say, name some. Read your Bible. You'll figure it out. We got, we got no business going to all these things that the world promotes and that they talk about.
I see people that claim to be saved that they, they post and go into the Taylor Swift concerts. They go in line dancing. You ain't got no, you ain't, not, you, that is not holiness. God is not within a million miles of that junk. You got no business going to country music concerts and, and rock and roll concerts and, and places where, where it's nothing but debauchery and, and drugs and alcohol and, and all of that kind of stuff. And sadly, you got to preach it in the churches today, smoking dope. That'll be coming up in the church covenant in the next week or two. That's going to be fun. He left his place. He went to the far country. Can I just tell you that if you're saved, God has a place for you. You fit in if you're in God's place, if you're where God wants you to do. God has a perfect will for each one of his children. Guess what happened to this young man? The security of home was gone. You know what else was gone? The protection of the father. You leave God's place where he wants you, you can kiss your protection goodbye. God is under no obligation. Now, he did say, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I get all of that stuff. But you know what happens too many times? They're banking. Rebels bank on the mercy of God. Well, guess what? Maybe God will just say, you know what? You want to go out there and live like hell? And I didn't just cuss. That's the way he was living. God just say, have at it. And he might even say, how's that working out for you? Go to Proverbs chapter 27. This kind of a message this morning. There's no doubt in my mind God wants this message preached this morning. Can I share with you probably something I'm not supposed to share with you? Like in the preacher's manual, you shouldn't say this. I plan on preaching this message last Sunday. And after the service, we had to cancel morning service because of the weather and get cleaned up. And we had afternoon service. And I was planning on, I came, the service started with me planning on preaching this message last Sunday. And you can ask Skip if I'm telling the truth. God changed it. and God, Just before, just during a congregational singing, God said, save it till next week. The people that need to hear it are not here this morning or this afternoon. But you're here today and you're hearing it. And so you ought to thank God that he loves you enough that he sent a preacher who cares about you to preach this message for you. Proverbs chapter 27, verse number 8. Because I'm just being honest with you. I'm just being honest with you. I see things out of some people in this church right now. It's scaring me to death of what the future holds. If you keep going down mentally, if you, if you go down physically and spiritually the path that you're already on mentally. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 8. As a bird that wandereth from her nest, so is a man that wandereth from his place. Fly, little bird, be free. No. There, amen, stay in your place. Stay where God wants you. And here's what the devil is probably whisker, whispering in some of your ears right now. Pastor just preaching that because he don't want you to leave the church. And, and he don't want to say that somebody... No, it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with you being where God wants you to be. In the safety and protection of God's place for you. Can I just tell you uh, that this uh, prodigal son here, guess what? Nobody kicked him out. Mom and dad did not kick him out. 
He made a choice to leave. I'll just be honest with you, and th this has been my way of living for years and years, but the older I get, it's, e it's even more so. I like being at home. I mean, I, I mean, at the, at the house. Man, I got, I got to get out of here. It's, the walls are closing in on me. I got, it's driving me crazy. I don't have to go anywhere. I'm okay. There's times, uh, there's times I do not leave this property for two or three days in a row. Sometimes it's rare. But there, there have been multiple times, even recently, where I'm, I walk out those doors Thursday and I'll come back over Friday and I'll come back over Saturday, be in the office and things like that. But I don't leave that property till Monday. I like being at home. But man, I know some people, they can't stand it. Especially young people. They got to just go somewhere. Man, I just, there's no place like home. You say, what's the big deal? I, there's safety, there's peace, there's quiet. No strangers. Amen. But today, people, people just don't like staying home anymore. And then, not only did he go to a place that he shouldn't have gone, but he started doing things he shouldn't have done. Look at verse 13. We read the first part, not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country. What did he do that he shouldn't have done? And there wasted his substance with riotous living. Blew the money, living like the devil out in the world. Do you know what's bad today with technology? You can go to the far country without taking a step. You know what you get when th with these things? The far country comes to you. There's a lot of times I've seen over the years where, where parents will have children that will leave home. And, and mom and dad will say, I didn't see anything coming. You weren't looking probably. You probably weren't looking. You say, well, where should I have looked? Number one, the bedroom. Look in their bedroom. Better yet, you want to know the ideal time to look in their bedroom? When they're not home. Or, where, where they're, or while they're outside. Well, I got to ask permission first. No, you don't. If you think that you have to ask your children's permission to go into their bedroom, I say with all the love I can muster, you're an idiot. That's your bedroom. They just happen to be living in it. That is not theirs. I don't understand. I didn't see it. Okay, Junior, if you're crazy enough to let your kids have a phone, say, I want to see your phone right now. And just start looking around on their phone. Guess what? The signs that you didn't think were there, were there. Find out what music they're listening to. Oh, I'm not worried about that. I mean, it says the Tolbert's on it. Yeah, uh-huh. I don't know if you can write over CDs like that. Like, but I, I, remember, I remember when I was a kid, cassette tapes. You can make that label say anything you want to say, and it doesn't mean nothing as to what's on it. Do you realize, Mom and Dad, you have sole authority and responsibility to dictate who your kids' friends are? Well, I just, 
I just don't think I could, you know, boss them around in that area. Do you make them go to school? Do you make them do their homework? Why is it you can make them do their schoolwork, but you can't make them hang around the right people? Do yourself a favor. Run into a brick wall with your head first about 20 miles an hour, about three times. Maybe that'll knock some sense into you. See, this is kind of blunt today. People don't get the subtle stuff no more. You, you got to, sometimes, sadly, preachers got to use shock and awe to get the message across. Well, I don't know what you mean. Well, after this message, you're going to know what I mean. You don't have to, it should, it, should, it should ease some of the, I got a question about what you meant. You don't have to worry about that today. How are you living? We know how the prodigal son was living. How about you? You might be a father or a mother, but you can still be prodigal. Because if you're saved, you're a child of God. So you can still be the prodigal son, the prodigal daughter at any age. In private, what are you doing? What secrets are you hiding? We see here in verses 14 through 16, he paid a cost he never should have had to pay. Verse 14. Ha, look, look at the, there is no, there is no drawn out process here. The end of verse 13, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. The very next statement, and when he had spent all, when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Not a desirable job for somebody who's Jewish. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. Not a favorable menu for somebody who's Jewish. And no man gave unto him. That what was the cost that he had to pay? He lost it all. Well, I think it's fair to say, Brother Craig, that he didn't intend to end up that way. Well, duh, but what do you think's going to happen? When you, when you waste your substance with riotous living, what do you think is going to happen? Do you know how many, and listen, we had a mission work. We had a street work in Buffalo. Do you know how many drunks have told me out of their own lips, I never thought it'd get this bad. Do you know how many drug addicts uh, I, I've caught uh, and drunks passed out in the doorway of a building, a business, an apartment building? They say, I never pictured myself here. Well, what do you think is going to happen? But guess what? I'm going to be different. <laughs> stupid. You're stupid if you think that. No, you're not. Well, it wasn't supposed to happen to him. It was supposed to. It was inevitable for it to happen to him. Because the devil will mess with your mind. Oh, you, you're not going to be like the rest of them. You're, you're not going to be like the rest of them. How many people used to go to this church that are not in this church no more who never pictured themselves not being in this church? Oh, not me. Ah, mm. When he was at home, he had all that he needed. Was he eating pig food at the father's house? Was he worried about his next meal at the father's house? Nope. It was the first time in his life. It says there at the end of verse 14, and he began to be in want. It was the first time in his life he was ever wanting
he left home for the bright lights in the big city, and he ended up broke, starving, literally, in the pig pen. And you know what happens when you walk out on God and you leave the Father's house? You're going to end up in the pig pen of this world. I don't know of a nastier animal on a farm than a pig. Or some of you farmers may tell me that there's something nastier, but it's in the top two or three of the nastiest animals on a farm. Go over to the book of Amos. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, chapter number 8. Amos chapter 8, verse number 9. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon. Well, what? The sun's not supposed to go down at noon. It does if God causes it to. And if, it, if the sun goes down at noon, we know two things. Number one, God caused it. And number two, he must have had a reason for it. And I will darken the earth in the clear day. And I will turn your feasts into mourning. And all your songs into lamentation. And I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the morning of an, of an only son. And the end thereof as a bitter day. Now, we understand that the prodigal son had a brother, okay? But, but there's no doubt verses 9 and 10 is what happened to the prodigal son. Guess what he found out? It was dark at noon. His mourning was turned into lamentation. Go over to Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5, look at verse number 1. My son, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding that thou mayest regard discretion and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. <laughs> you know how many young men have been taken out of church because of the winking and smooth flattering words of a girl. I could tell you story after story after story after story. Oh, not her. She's a good girl. Mm-hmm. How's that working out for you? Maybe we should just change the title of the message to, to how's that working out for you. Oh, she's a good girl. Well, let's see what God says. Verse 5. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. <laughs> you don't even ever have to ask God what he's thinking about the situation. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her and come not nigh the door of her house. Did you hear what that said? Don't go to her house. Hey, future prodigals, you better watch whose house you're at. 
There's some houses you ought not be, you ain't got no business being in. I'll say amen to myself. Thank you very much. I don't care how you think mean I'm being. I'm not being mean. I don't want to see people end up in the pig pen. So when you go give your little report about the sermon today, make sure you add the part. Don't leave out the part that I said I did it because I'm caring about people. Lest thou give, verse 10, thine honor unto others and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. I didn't think it was going to get that bad. I didn't think my eye was going to end up like that. God told you it would. God told you it would. And say, how have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof? If you don't like the message today, then at least be honest and admit it with your own mouth how I hate instruction. Preacher, whatever you do, don't tell me the truth. Preach lies to me like they did in the book of Isaiah. And have not obeyed the voice of, thy, of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. Go over to chapter 21, Proverbs chapter 21. Verse number 17. He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. What, what do you think, Brother Craig, what do you think the Lord's trying to say there? He's trying to say that he that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. Go to chapter 23, Proverbs chapter 23, verse number 19. Hear thou my son and be wise and guide, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Hearken unto thy father that, uh, uh, that begat thee and despise not thy mother when she is old. Be not among wine bibbers, among riotous uh, 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 eaters of flesh. Who are you hanging out with? You better be careful who you're hanging out with. Go back over to Luke chapter 15. Here's where a lot of parents and adults, parents of prodigals and friends of prodigals, here's where a lot of them mess up. Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 16. And he would have fain, and he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. And look what it says. And no man gave unto him. Now what happens is this. All right. Prodigals get the inheritance, right? They, they walk out of the father's house. They know exactly how much they got, what they got. And they're banking on if they blow it all, they're banking on somebody bailing them out. But guess what? That was a gamble he lost because no man gave unto him. Parents of prodigals, quit bailing them out. Friends of prodigals, quit bailing them out. Nowhere in this text do we find the father going after the son. Hard truth, mom and dad. Hard truth, friend. But dad did not go bail him out. He was not organizing a search team. He 
was not posting on social media. He was not getting people uh, gathered up. Hey, okay, you guys look over here. You guys look over here. You guys look over here. I'll go here. I'll go there. Hey, listen, mom and dad, it'll kill you. Friend of a prodigal, it'll kill you. Stay on the porch. That young man left because he was a rebel, not because he was forced out. God did, the father did not make him live a riotous living. Well, you know, I just, it's, it's my kids, it's, it's my friend. Yeah, and guess what? You keep bailing them out, they ain't coming home. Why would they come home when they have everything out there that they need? Does not God treat us the same way? You're going to live like hell. Guess what? He's going to let you. He's going to let you. Now, he's God, so, you know, he controls more things. He may make situations in your life be such that you say, duh, what am I doing out here? Thank God. He, 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 he was making choices he shouldn't have made. He was, he was eating things that, he, that, he was, uh, that God never intended him to eat, that he never intended to eat. And look what it said in verse number 17. It says, and when he came to himself, the prodigal is not going to return until he comes to himself. That's when the prodigal will come home, when he comes to himself. If he humbles himself... He did something that he never would have had to do if he would have just stayed home. Look in verse 18. And I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned. Let me just tell you something. You want to know if a prodigal is truly repentant or not? They will be repentant when they acknowledge their sin. But you take a prodigal and they feigning, you know, want. listen, a lot of times prodigals don't want to come back because they sinned. They just got sick of the pig pen. It's not because they were sinners. It's not because they were wasters. It's, it has nothing, them coming back has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with, they just didn't want to eat corn husks anymore. When I hear somebody talking about, I want to get things right, and you know, I want to, I, want, I want to make things right. If they can't acknowledge that they messed up, if they can't say I was wrong, I, I'm, I sinned, I'm sorry, that is not real repentance. That is, I'm sorry I got caught. I'm sorry I'm eating the pig food. I'm sorry I'm living in a pig pen. It's not, it's, it, it wasn't a sin. He humbled himself. He repented. He confessed. Verse 10, and I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of my, thy hired servants. You want to know what? Well, I, I hear these preachers preach about repentance, and you preach about what is repentance? That's repentance. Verses 18 and 19 is repentance. Then we realize, number seven, we realize, he, he realized something he should have never forgot. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. You know what he realized? He should have never forgot that life was better back at the father's house. He remembered how good the father was. He remembered how much his father loved him. Which proves my point. Everything he went looking for in the far country, he already had back at the father's house. 
Oh, but Brother Craig, them, I mean, it didn't last long. But don't you think he had fun those few days? Sure he did. Had a blast. You cannot say he did not. Doesn't the book of Hebrews say that there is pleasure in sin? For a season. We forget that season part. You know what? You leave the Father's house, you go out and you live like the devil. Guess what? Your flesh will enjoy it. I think one of the areas where preachers mess up is they try to, they try to keep young people in church by telling them that if they go out and live like the devil, they're not going to like it. And then they find out that the preacher was lying because they are liking it for the moment. What else did the preacher lie about? Well, I'll just tell you right now, you go out there and live after the flesh, you will enjoy it for a little while. But it's only going to be a season. And then payday will come. Did it not come for him? So here's, here, here's, a, here's, a, here's a little, and, I, and it's a repeat, I said this, but, but get this in your mind regarding this story. Not all prodigals come home and not all prodigals leave. That other son was just as much a prodigal in his heart and in his attitude. And he never took the first step off from the father's property. So I asked you a question this morning. You're here, but are you here? You're here, but are you here? And the second question is this. You're here, but have you left? You're here, but have you left? I would not be one bit surprised that there, if somebody is here, but you're just biding your time and you're waiting for the right conditions to be met, the right circumstances, Maybe this message is what you've been waiting for. Now it's time. You better be careful. As the pastor of this church, I'm staying on the porch. I'm not. You want to go out and live like hell and waste your life and substance and riotous living? I'm not chasing you. I'm going to pray for you because guess what? God, my prayers can reach heaven quicker than you can reach the end of your rope. What are you saying? If I leave, you're not going to call me or text me? Oh, I might shoot you an occasional text that I miss you, I love you, I'm praying for you. But I'm not jumping in the car, dragging you back. The father didn't drag the son back. You want to know why the, fa- you want to know why the son came home? Before he came home, he came to himself. You can come back to the church without coming to yourself. You want to know why the Lord laid on my heart to preach this message today? I'm trying with the help of God and the following of the leadership of the Holy Ghost, I'm trying to prevent an illustration. It would be a lot better for you to maintain a testimony than become an illustration. There's a difference. Hear what I said. It's easier to maintain a testimony than to become an illustration. I know how the devil works. Oh, he's, he's just trying to, you know, keep his crowd and he don't want to lose numbers. They, quit listening to the devil. 
I'm trying to, I'm trying to, God, I, I, I'm, I didn't mean me. God is trying to prevent some pig pen experiences. I'll say it now so I don't have to say it then because I, I wouldn't want to. The, product, the father would have been totally justified in saying, I told you so. Told you so. Say, Brother Craig, everybody's here. I mean, we got, we got some people here that are here. Yeah, the problem is this. The problem is this. There's attitudes. That I'll just be honest with you. As a pastor, I'm supposed to be diligent to know the state of my flock, right? And I, I sense attitudes that just scare me. Not for me, not for the church, for people. For people. There's not a preacher whose heart is right with God. There's not a father whose heart is right with God. There's not a mother whose heart is right with God. There's not a friend whose heart is right with God that delights in seeing people end up in the pig pen. Not at all. Not at all. You know what that father did every day when that son was gone? He lived his life. He did what he was supposed to do. There's a, uh, uh, some of y'all have been around, you know, uh, in Buffalo and all that. You know who I'm talking about when I mention Alan Jones's name. I love Brother Jones. Now, Brother Jones, you gotta you gotta know how cynical he is to appreciate this. But Brother Jones did not think that Craig Cobb was ever going to do anything for God. And I'm not saying that maybe I didn't give him reason to think that. But when I saw him at Don Green's funeral here two years ago, he said, I cannot believe you. I said, what? He goes, you're still at it. I said, Brother Jones, what am I going to do? And I've seen people that have visited this church, that have said this to people in this church and have said it to me, you're still doing it. Well, what else are we going to do? Am I perfect? No. Do I make mistakes? Yes. Do I sin? Yes, every day. But I'm going to tell you right now, Amen. Up until this point in my life, I've just determined that life is better at the Father's house. I am not. Hey, listen, my diet's changed in the last few weeks. I'm eating things that I never ate, amen, but I'll never plan on eating pig pen food. That does not interest me, amen. I'll branch out, but I ain't going there. About an hour after our afternoon service, I'll be sitting at the table over there eating asparagus. I'm glad y'all are sitting down. Can't believe it. But I'm not eating corn husks meant in Miss Christie's pig bucket. Amen? Life is better at the Father's house. God's food tastes way better than the devil's food. You're at the Father's house, you can eat the fatted calf every day. He was thinking things he should have never thought. He had an attitude he should have never had. He asked for things he should have never asked for. He lived a way that he never should have lived. He went to places he should have never went. He had to repent. He would have never had to repent because he didn't have anything to repent of, but he messed up, so he had to repent. 
Well, here's what it's called today. Here's what it's called today. Well, you know, these kids today, they got to sow their wild oats. Quit making excuses. Why don't you just say it the way it's supposed to be said? You know, these kids today, they're rebels. It's not sowing your wild oats. It's rebellion. It's not sowing your wild oats. It's disobedience against God. It's disobedience against God's word. God expect me to be perfect? Yes. Matter of fact, he does. Be ye therefore perfect. I don't know if any of us have attained it, but that's what our goal is. You say, what do you mean? Stay at the Father's house. Stay at the Father's house. You know what's an amazing thing about a prodigal? I never thought about this expression before. I, I feel free to use this. I just coined this phrase. Um, repeat prodigals. Say, what do you mean? Haven't we learned from the last time we left the father's house that it wasn't worth it? But what are we going to do? We're going to leave the father's house again. Stupid. Dumb. What an idiotic move. What's the matter? You want, you want seconds? Pig pen 2.0? You, knew, you know the first time, the second time, the third time it wasn't worth it. What makes you think it's going to be worth it this time? It is not going to be worth it. Sin is never worth it. By and by. And even though your flesh might think it's worth it, your spirit is not going to think the consequences are worth it. Could I please have a raise of hands this morning of anybody in here who has experienced the chastening hand of God? It is not fun. But it seems like it at the time. That's that pleasure of sin for a season. If, if you could come play... Where are you at this morning? I just got a question for you. One question. One question. One question. Are you right now physically and spiritually at the Father's house? If one or the other, if, if only one is, if you're, if, if you're here physically, but you're not here spiritually. I'm talking about at the Father's house. You are a prodigal. You're here. But are you here? You're here. But have you left? And then some of you may know a prodigal. You might be a friend to one. You might be related to one. Maybe the Lord would lead you to pray for that person. Lord, bless the invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.